A. Hey there. Can you hear Hi. me okay? Yeah. Perfect. I was just talking and realized I'm muted. Thanks so much for popping on early. I, um, you know, I'm just like thinking through all the nuts and bolts of things and kind of wanting to make sure that we know what we're doing. Yeah, definitely. Um, let's see. Let me just make sure. All right, I'm gonna make you a co-host. Okay, let's see. Should be good. All right, it looks like Tim is already in the waiting room. Maybe give us a couple more. Okay. A little bit, yeah, only because I know he's going to. Um, also need to share a screen. Yeah, and so we'll maybe just practice ours before we before okay. we jump into it. So you don't, you're thinking it would be more challenging to try to share it from your end? Um, I mean, point. I. I can, but I'll also have to manually admit um, people as they flock in. Um, so, I mean, I can do both. Let me see. Here. Um, do you have a, a PDF copy? You know, I downloaded one. Yes, okay. I did download one because I um, realized, like, you know, working off of Peggy's <laughs> site is a little more challenging. So yeah, I was able to download one. Okay. I can try sharing it my own, because I have I do have two screens here. I'm just trying to make okay. sure I don't, um, I got to sign out of my, it's called um, VPN. Oh yeah. Because if I don't, it could blow me out once I start doing too much stuff. Oh, gotcha, okay. Um, yeah, well, so is I can share. Um, I mean, there's not that many slides on our end. True of our, of our end. Okay. So um, let me see if I can just download a PDF real quick. Those three little bullets in the upper right-hand corner. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those should, if you click on those, that should allow you to download it. Perfect. All right, let's make sure that I have the right share screen. Okay, presenting. Let's see, I can never remember what I also have two screens and I can't remember which screen I'm supposed to be sharing. Let's see if it's this one. It looks like your note, your notes. There it is. Is this the right one? Well, that looks perfect. Okay. 
Nice. So when you so when it's time for Tim or Willet to share theirs, you're gonna have to hit stop share and that way they can grab sharing. Yeah. Okay. You know what though? When I click that, my screen goes away to admit people. I wonder if I have the ability because I um uh, your co host worst case scenario, yeah. If I okay, if I so go to I'm gonna to try to admit Tim and, and Willet. Hey Ben. All right, I'm gonna to try to admit them just to see if I can take that off your hands. All right, I'm gonna go and run to the bathroom. I'll be back. Okay. Thank you, Peggy. Good afternoon. Hello, Jessica. Good to see you. <laughs> Good in, to see you. In virtual or whatever. Yes. <laughs> One dimensional world that we're in. Hi, Tim. Right. Tim, I don't know that you've met Mr. Kempton before, Professor Kempton before, but um, Tim is our other uh, presenter today, Willett, and he will be talking about a project, a bus to grid project that he's been working on at the um, his school district in Illinois. Great. Williamsfield Schools in Illinois. Um, unfortunately, I have to let you both know that our Vermont um, school, South Burlington School District is un unable to join our presentation today. So Peggy, our Vermont Clean Cities Coordinator is going to be doing a little double duty, trying to share some highlights from their pilot project that they're putting together. Okay. Okay. Nice to meet you, Professor Willett. Likewise. I've heard a lot about you. I've got, I work <laughs> with the, the newbie team quite a bit. So I have, yeah. I work with Dick Johnson, who I think, and a handful of folks that I think you're connected with. Oh yeah, definitely. I've known Dick. I've been working with Dick on V to G for a decade, I think. And <laughs> uh, also with Newbie for about the same amount of time. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you both sound good and I can see you both. So that's one check of the box. <laughs> I'm wondering if you if you want to try Will it sharing your screen and then stop sharing and then we'll have Tim share and stop share. So the way that this is going to work with Zoom is one of us, if we are like, for example, um, John, who is also on the phone with us today, um, is going to be sharing a few slides from the Clean Cities folks, but we'll have to stop sharing in order for you to share. So you'll have to just remember at the end of the presentation to hit that stop sharing. And oh, you beautiful. should see a screen there and that should be full screen. Oh, <clears throat> that's perfect, will it? Do you wanna just okay. go ahead and scroll one slide just to make sure you've got that? slide uh good thing perfect. you asked because when i used the arrow it didn't work surprisingly oh there we go i see okay yeah so that's clear i take it <clears throat> perfect yep and if you want to go ahead and stop sharing we'll, we'll test tim's perfect that was easy stop. and quick yep. yeah that was a nice quick uh, transition <clears throat> nice tim go ahead and scroll through a couple of slides there Mm. Nice. Good. Tim's got better graphics than I do. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're going to hit both style of learner, I guess. We're going right. to have words and pictures. There you go. Love it. Love it. <laughs> Perfect. So a little, little round of introductions for you all. Um, right now, joining us from the Maine Clean Communities, which is hosted at the Greater Portland Council of Governments in Maine, is um, Jonathan. Do you want to just say hi to everybody, John? Yeah, hey, nice to meet you guys. Uh, definitely have heard a lot about you in the planning of this webinar. So excited to, to hear what um, you guys have to share. Yep. And also with us, she popped down for a moment, but Peggy O'Neill Vivanka, who is the Vermont Clean Cities Coordinator and longtime collaborator with uh, our New Hampshire Clean Cities Coalition. Peggy. Hi there. Can you all hear me? I'm just like Major Tom. Can, what is it? Major Tom to, to ground control here. And I. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. No, no problem. <laughs> nice to meet you. And I know you. Sarah's going to be kind of flying in right at the last minute. So um, we'll get started. And I know she'll be on to join us at some point at when we start at 3.30. So we got actually five minutes to just kind of chill. And and so did, um, I don't know if Jessica mentioned to you while I was like trying to plug in my headset here, um, the third presenter, um, Gary Marcus from the South Burlington School District had um, something urgent and unexpected come up. So uh, I'm going to be pinch hitting. 
all good. It happens. This is the world that we're living in now, right? I, I know. I, you know, when he's when he emailed me, I just said, well, if nothing else, we've just really learned to be kind of kind and generous to one another. And then I immediately crawled into the fetal position under my desk. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah i said to peggy this will be good we can allow professor campton and tim more time to talk and we'll we can take more questions you know more yeah. discussions so we won't have any kind of rush through anything and, I, and hopefully that will create for some better discussion from folks i know a lot of times we find that the presentations take up more time than we anticipate and then there's not as much time for q a and that's where you really kind of dig into the meat of things anyway so Mm -hmm. um, hey, Jessica and Peggy, do you guys see the poll option um, at the bottom? Because I don't think I'll have access to that when sharing. So I just want to make sure that either of you. Um, poll options. Polls. Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So you can okay. launch it and OK. OK. okay. So I won't have, I won't be able to see that um, in presentation mode. So. Um, if you guys so just... when we get to the polls on the slide, Peg, do you want it? me to launch the first one or can you launch the first one because I'll be talking and I think then if I'll launch the, the last one because you'll okay. be talking or Sarah will be talking so vice versa yeah. so if you can launch that one that would be great. If you just, there, and there's a slide that says poll so I don't need to yep. remember where it goes. Okay, perfect. Yep, I got it. Okay, and let me just... We had a bunch of people sign up for this. That's a good sign. That's the wrong. A screen. lot of times I find that people sign up just because they want to tap into the recording after the fact. They might not be able to make it to the webinar, but at least they're planning on tuning in for the recording. So. Yes, and I have we'll a couple take people who, we'll who are doing that, which is great. They're on energy committees, which are really helpful. Um, you're seeing the, are you seeing the correct screen right now? Um, I'm uh, seeing, that's not, it's not in presentation mode. <laughs> okay, let's see. Oh, this one, here we go. Now? Yep. Yes. That's, yeah. Okay. Now, um, actually, John, do you want to make Peggy also a presenter if you haven't already? Because I'm just realizing I'm going to be t introducing the slides. I may not have be able to admit everyone. Yes, she is also a co-host. Okay, so Peggy, okay. when we get when we get to, actually, if maybe now we want to start. Let's start admitting, admitting. people. Yeah. Okay. So, do, and we want do we want to mute all? Um, yes, everybody should be muted on entrance okay and then they can uh, they can unmute themselves is that it okay so i'm going to admit all hello Jessica, you're muted. Ah, yeah, that's better. Thank you, Peggy. That's funny. Well, it sounds like the doorbell is quieting down a little bit from everybody joining. So I think we'll go ahead and get launched here. I want to start by welcoming everybody to our medium and heavy duty webinar series today. We've got a fabulous agenda prepared for you all. We're so excited that you can join us. Um, today, we're going to be focusing on vehicle to grid charging technologies with a um, with the relationship to electric school buses. So um, I'm Jessica Wilcox with the Granite State Clean Cities Coalition, which is in New Hampshire. And I'm joined today by my colleagues in Vermont and Maine at the Clean Cities there, John Gagnon with Ver, with the Maine Clean Communities, Peggy O'Neill Vivanka with Vermont Clean Cities, and Sarah as well will be joining us from Maine shortly. Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide, John. 
So a little bit about uh, who Clean Cities is. Um, we're basically boots on the ground in our consecutive states and we collaborate a lot on working with stakeholders, which is you know, towns and city reps, schools, utilities, businesses and large fleets who are interested in transitioning to clean transportation fuels. And that runs the gamut of propane, natural gas, and obviously the big, uh, the big exciting one lately has been electric vehicles, in particular medium and heavy duty electric vehicles, which is why we've been all working together on this. Next slide, John. So we're part of the Clean Cities. It's a national organization of, of a network of coalitions across the country that are supported by the US Department of Energy. And we generally are hosted here in our consecutive states by different organizations. And we're very much involved in education and outreach events and supporting our, our community stakeholders. Next slide, John. Some of the work that you've seen us do is hosting big events. Um, vehicle ride and drives, providing presentations or webinar opportunities like today's, um, just collaborating, coordinating, uh, providing technical support to our stakeholders in our communities. Next slide, John. And I'd like to start with welcoming you all and finding out a little bit about whether or not you've delved into this topic before. Have, have you or your organization previously explored vehicle to grid technology? I'm going to go ahead and launch the poll. Thank you, Peggy. And the options are, yes, we have, no, not yet, we've explored it, or what is V2J? And that may be why you're here today. We'll give everybody a moment here to respond. It looks like the two favorites coming out in the lead are, yes, I've already uh, explored vehicle to grid technology and not yet, but maybe in the future. So that kind of puts a little bit of the onus on our two presenters today <laughs> to whet your appetites and get you excited about vehicle to grid. We'll go ahead and move on from here. Go to, go to the next slide, John. So I'd like to start by introducing our keynote speaker today um, and talking a little bit about vehicle to grid charging technology. And let's hear it from the father of, v of V2G himself, Willett Kempton. He's professor in the College of Earth, Ocean and the Environment and in the Department of Electrical and Computer en Engineering at the University of Delaware. Professor Kempton directs about 10 professional researchers and graduate students in research on clean energy technologies. He lectures and publishes scientific and technical articles on offshore wind, power, and electric transportation. Professor Kempton has created the concept of using electric vehicles to provide grid services and has actually been awarded four patents for technologies that are integrating EVs with the power grid. Now, Professor Kempton is going to introduce us to the vehicle to grid concept, provide an overview of the basics, highlight the technology's role in supporting the advancement of renewable energy, battery storage, and a more resilient electric grid. We're going to stop sharing our slides and turn the slide deck over to Professor Kempton and hear a little bit more from him. Okay. <clears throat> Hello, and thanks so much for uh, inviting me. Um, <clears throat> you should see a slide on the screen. Looks good. Okay, so um, appreciate the uh, interest, and uh, this is a an introduction. Um, so <clears throat> I'll step through this, and I think have a chance for uh, questions and discussion as we move on with the other panelists as well. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> just to introduce my group which uh, Jessica already did to some extent. We, uh, we have uh, expertise in electric vehicle engineering, design, implementation, also electrical standards, which are important when you're connecting anything to the grid, which might push power back onto the grid. Um, <clears throat> and we actually are driving a couple of uh, standards right now with the Society for Automotive Engineers, which specify how to do V2G in a, in a uh, high value and safe way. <clears throat> um, we also work at the uh, federal level as well as state and EU levels uh, for implementation of policies uh, for EVs, but in particular for using EVs in this way. Uh, and then also we work on tariffs and requirements um, at the um, <clears throat> ISO level, for example, in the region we're talking about, it's the ISO of New England, and also what are called EDCs, that is the utilities, the companies that do run the wires out to your uh, to your house or business or school district. Uh, so our goals as a uh, uh, as a R and D group are to prove out cost effective engineering with um, 
allowed cost-effective market entry. So you can have a great bus and equipment on it, but if you're not allowed to enter the market, you can't earn any money from that. So we're working on both of those areas. Um, <clears throat> we are applying new standards and rules so that they're proven and working with commercial partners, notably uh, Nuvi, uh, who is, is represented uh, today as an aggregator of the multiple vehicles to create a, a valuable service. <clears throat> Just to give a sense, you know, I'm not doing all this by myself. Uh, so there's a, a team at the University of Delaware and also a, a very large team at, at Nuvi, uh, which is working on the, on the uh, deployment and commercial implementation. <clears throat> um, key aspects of the V to G concept, um, Electric vehicles, whether it's a car or a truck or a bus, uh, they already have battery and they have conversion equipment. That is, that can go from a battery from the grid to, to the battery to charge up the battery, or less typically, but with V2G, it's going the other direction from the battery uh, onto the grid. So those those that equipment is already in the vehicle. Uh, people talk about just the battery, but it's this additional equipment that's also important. Um, <clears throat> the bus fleet has a predictable time of driving and parking. Of course, there's special events and so forth, uh, school holidays, but uh, it is a fairly predictable uh, fleet. Um, you know, the cars are not, not as predictable, um, but in the large aggregate, they are predictable. So you don't know when Jones is gonna go to the store, but you know, it, you know 80 to 85% of vehicles in New Hampshire are gonna be parked you know, from these hours. So uh, you, you, you have more predictability with smaller numbers on a school bus fleet. Um, <clears throat> and the whole concept, you know, the design here is you don't make the, the driver or the fleet operator or the district understand all the details of value of the grid and when, what hours electricity is needed and so forth. They, the driver is just told, use a vehicle normally, be sure to plug in when it's not in use. So the normal electric vehicle, whether it's a heavy vehicle or a light vehicle, some people would say, well, I'm only gonna plug in when I need it. I can drive, get to work another three days or take the kids out another three days um, without plugging in. So with B2G, there's a value to that resource when it's plugged in. So well, that's one instruction that we would give the drivers, even if you don't need a charge, plug in please. Uh, there's another one I didn't list here on the slide, but also if there's an unusual use or a time when normally you wouldn't be using the vehicle, but it's needed for a long trip, so you want the battery full, then there'd need to be some advance notice. It might be a thing you put on the app, or you might just tell the fleet dispatcher, you know, hey, I'm going to need this vehicle on you know Saturday morning at, at 7 a.m., and I'm going to need to drive 150 miles. So... <clears throat> There is, a, there is usage of the battery. It doesn't detract from driving, except if you use it in an unusual way for uh, an, an unusual time of day, then there needs to be some kind of advance uh, notice. So minor inconvenience. <clears throat> um, the uh, aggregation, I, I talked about that a bit, but the idea is you're always meeting trip needs of any individual, whether it's a bus or a car. Um, but at the same time, in the aggregate, you can meet the needs of the grid when they have too much power or when they need more power. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then um, <clears throat> the, the, what, we're, what we're trying to do here, the overall goal is we're trying to use electric vehicles to help, uh, it helps make the grid more reliable even if there are no renewables, but renewables are mostly, the low cost renewables are a variable generation. That is they produce more or less power depending on the weather and the time of day. Um, so we want to help to integrate those and storage is part of that. Storage is an important part of using more and more renewables on the grid. So <clears throat> electric vehicles become a way to provide storage for renewables, which helps to deal with the problem of CO2. Um, and so the transportation fleet becomes uh, part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Uh, just kind of illustratively, these are courtesy of Nuvi, but they did a really nice graphic, I think, to sort of show the basic idea. Apologies, it's a car rather than a, a bus here, but you can imagine any kind of vehicle you, you like uh, in the middle there. Um, but it's, you know, it's five steps. You, you plug in when you're done driving, 
it's any charger, but it has to be one that knows about V to G, like it's got the V to G label on it. So it's not quite any charger. Um, you plug in, it's maybe the battery is depleted as shown in this diagram from a long trip. Uh, more typically when you plug in, you've got half or two thirds of battery uh, power. But um, the first thing that happens is that the battery is filled up to a certain level that may be based on a prediction of when the next trip is, or it may be based on a uh, specification by the user. They may say, I want to never have less than 50 miles range here, for example. So uh, the Nuvi aggregator will take account of these. And the first thing it may do, if needed, is to charge up to the desired level. Um, <clears throat> then, you know, you've got enough uh, probably for your next trip, or at least you've got plenty of time to add that. Um, and now you can uh, provide grid services. That is, you're providing the storage in the vehicle as a resource to the grid, and if it's properly registered and so forth, you can be paid for that. Now, I'm mostly talking about grid services, V2G, um, but you also can at times, uh, again, depending on the tariffs and so forth, you can save money on your electric bill. So without registering with the grid operator, uh, you may be able to lower your bill, for example, by charging off peak as a simple case, or to take that one step further, you maybe discharge on peak where electricity is valuable and you get paid a higher amount for that. And then you recharge the part that you discharged and add some more charging, say in the middle of the night where electricity is lower cost. So that's kind of more easily understood by people who know about peak power and off peak power, um, but it's uh, not necessarily as valuable. So that's why we try to do the, the greater amount of effort and why Nuvi has developed the capabilities of doing the left-hand side of this, also uh, selling uh, power to the, to the grid. <clears throat> um, and you know the uh, battery may have been full enough for your next trip anyway, but the, uh, the, the uh, Nuvi aggregator uh, will ensure that the time that comes when your next trip is expected, there'll be more than enough in the battery to provide uh, for that trip. So that's the overall concept, <clears throat> um, just on one page here. <clears throat> Plug in when you come back. First thing, first priority, charge up the vehicle. It was purchased to deliver kids. It was purchased to get you to the grocery store. Uh, that's the first priority. And you have to make sure there's enough in there for the driver. Um, and then you've got usually quite a long time where you can either uh, make money by selling a service to the grid or maybe reduce your electric bill. Um, but at the time you're next gonna drive, uh, there's going to be enough in the battery for that purpose. <clears throat> uh, just uh, kind of without going into all the details here, uh, the black bars on this graph, which are from uh, Lazard, uh, which does a calculation of how much storage costs. So this is like addressed to grid operators and they're looking at how many batteries do we need to balance out power on the grid? Well, the black bars show the costs with right, more to the right is higher costs. And uh, just as an illustration, the blue uh, uh, and green bars there at that cost, that's the cost of storage from V to G because the batteries are already purchased to be able to drive to be able to move from one place to another, uh, to be able to deliver kids uh, to school or back home. Uh, and so that's already been paid. Now there's some additional costs. There's a little bit of extra management, there's some controls, there's registration up front, um, but it's way less expensive than buying batteries and placing them on the grid uh, for the purpose of serving these grid needs. <clears throat> um, and this is in operation. Uh, uh, the, uh, these are uh, uh, mostly Nuvi. One's the National Renewable Energy Lab up in the upper right and the University of Delaware project on the upper left there. Uh, the others are, are Nuvi systems that are implemented. So it's, um, you know, it's not just a theory here. It is uh, in operation. We'll hear from Tim in a couple of minutes about that as well. Um, <clears throat> and I guess I, I'll, I'll just note that, you know, the values, I'll, I'll look, look at some revenue values in, in a minute, but uh, you know, it can be a significant value to uh, uh, to provide grid services. <clears throat> so, um, the you know, I want to emphasize this: um, if if set up and 
correctly registered, you've got the right equipment, the grid may pay uh, for an EV bus fleet, which is providing storage uh, uh, for the grid. Um, <clears throat> now, where does that value go? Uh, you, you've got an aggregator, you've got people running the aggregator, you've got somebody you know, who addresses problems and comes out. Uh, so the aggregator needs to get some of that revenue. Uh, so how does that work? You know, and that's the business model that's to be discussed. I'm not sure exactly what Nuvi is offering right now, so I'm not speaking for them at all. But the value could be split between the owner of the vehicle and the aggregator, for example. Um, <clears throat> uh, or the aggregator may provide some service, like maybe it provides maintenance for the uh, charging stations. Uh, or it pay pays for part of the charging stations or part of the bus. Uh, so there's the, the uh, owner of the vehicle is providing a part of the resource and the aggregator is providing part of the resource that is controlling and actually turning a battery sitting in an extreme of cash. And then there's some kind of business relationship between the owner of the vehicle and the aggregator uh, to each for each to be appropriately compensated for that. And that's a you know business uh, negotiation. Again, I'm not involved in that. Um, <clears throat> but again, just to give a sort of rough idea of value, of value uh, take a single car, 10 kilowatts, the gross revenue can be from $50 to $1,800 per year based on the contracts, what market have you qualified for the high value market. And sometimes you can stack markets. That is, you can serve two functions usually at different times, uh, so you can actually get paid for both. Um, <clears throat> so, and that's a 10 kilowatt V car. I mean, a, a school bus might be 50 kilowatts. So it's proportional to the charging and discharging rate. It's not proportional to the battery size. Everybody thinks it's a bigger battery, but it's that whether you can charge and discharge faster, uh, the, the hitch is a kilowatt measure. Uh, so it could be, you know, five times that amount with all the, ifs and provisos there. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, so that's the, trying to get the basic concept across there and uh, back to Jessica here. <clears throat> Excellent, thank you so Oops. much for that introduction, Willa, very much appreciated. And it looks like we do have a few questions in the chat and just a reminder to everybody, please feel free to insert your questions as we go. We're gonna have time after each presenter and, and possibly even some time at the end. Um, for this discussion. So Willa, I will um, start with a couple of questions that I'm seeing here in chat. Do you have any comment on how vehicle to grid usage could affect the EV batteries warranty or service life? I'm thinking that this is probably pertaining to like a light duty vehicle um, or potentially an electric school bus on the larger end. Well, uh, so when um, uh, the University of Delaware has worked with various demonstration projects with vehicles. Um, and I believe uh, most or all of the Nuvi ones, uh, the, oh, the vehicle manufacturer knows that this is happening and they do some research to decide whether there's any um, <clears throat> effect, any no measurable effect or any noticeable effect. So uh, that, that would be something you would want to discuss with your providers. You know, there's a vehicle provider and then there's an aggregation service provider like Nuvi. Um, so you'd want to ask that question of them. But in the cases that uh, the University of Delaware has worked, the uh, vehicle owner has either, the, sorry, the manufacturer has either said, this is covered under the warranty. It doesn't have enough of an effect to matter. Um, <clears throat> or there's some other kind of arrangement made for a, you know, for a demonstration project. So uh, it, it can have an effect, but the effect is generally much smaller than seems to be believed. Um, Honda, um, Honda Americas um, and uh, University of Delaware published a paper which quantified it and put this in the open literature. We have had other discussions with OEM with auto manufacturers that they don't want public, but, but Honda found that um, in eight years of driving, which is the warranty period, uh, there was about an 8% loss in battery capacity just from driving and charging. And if V to G was added to that, it was an additional 2%. So it's noticeable, but you know, are you are you actually achieving revenue? Because if you're getting, if the owner of the vehicle is getting half of twelve hundred dollars a year, then um, that's probably worth a lot more than the cost of two percent battery degradation over an eight year period. Um, 
So that's, you know, it's something to look at, but it's pretty well established that it's not that much. And there are more and more vehicle manufacturers, bus and car, uh, who are saying we're not concerned about this. <clears throat> So you mentioned a study there, Willett. Is there any chance you can maybe um, insert in a response in the chat for a citation to that study? There was a request for a copy of that. Yeah, it'll take me a few minutes. So I'll try yep. it when I'm No problem. Speaking. Yeah, exactly. When we're done with the question and answer, just a, a note there. Um, you mentioned the aggregators and there is one uh, inquiry in the chat here that perhaps this was missed, but if you can just maybe highlight again, the purpose or role of the aggregator. Yeah, so um, the electric grid is very big. <clears throat> and in relation to that, um, a one car or one bus is very small. So uh, we're actually rounding errors, you know. So if you have just, uh, just one school bus, um, <clears throat> it's not enough to have a contract to provide service. And, and in fact, some of their measurements can't even register it. You know, it, it go, rounds to zero. Um, so... <clears throat> you have to aggregate, that is you have to put together uh, multiple vehicles, even if they're big school buses or trucks. Um, and that is required to have a contract, it's required to make bids. Uh, and this is something aggregator worries about. Also there's people, you know, but the kind of physical aggregator is a way of, of saying to the electric grid, we're not just one power plant in one location, we're, a hundred or we're a thousand little power plants out there and all each one of those has a meter on it and I the aggregator I'm going to tell you what they're doing so I'm going to add up all their meter values and then when you say oops we've got too much electricity now I'll I'll tell them all to charge more quickly so the aggregator is putting together both the ability to, for the grid operator to say, we need more right now, we need less right now. Uh, for the, uh, the ability for the grid operator to say that to one point, which is when I say an aggregator, it's a server with 100,000 lines of code running on it. Um, so the, the aggregator is a place for the grid operator to say, we need something now. And that gets done in you know a thousand places. Um, and also those thousand places report back and tell the grid, okay, we you said you needed 300 kilowatts, we just gave you 297, um, or it's probably not quite that accurate, you know, 308 or whatever. Uh, uh, so uh, it, it is an accurate metering. And, uh, it, and then there's people that go with that, the aggregator, it's a business, you know, so there's people who know what kind of charging stations are needed because you don't have the right kind of charging stations, this doesn't work. Um, there are people like Dick Johnson, you know, who talks to potential uh, users um, and, uh, then there's also the people who set up things with the grid operator and make bids. So, you know, they, they, they would say, um, well, it looks like we're going to have enough to do 500 kilowatts. So let's bid 500. We think we can make that for the next six hours. You know, none of that is anything the driver or fleet manager has to worry about. These people are, and one good thing about splitting the revenue is the aggregator is motivated to make the most money. And then that also makes the most money for the, uh, for the uh, owner of the vehicle. So the aggregator is a physical server communications, certification through meters and people to set everything up. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, can you talk about where vehicle to grid charge points are located? Do public and or workplace charges have vehicle to grid capabilities? Well, uh, there's really only a few that have that ability. So if you just go out and look at chargers in, you know, at your workplace or look at the, you know, at the uh, lows and see what chargers they've got, probably none of them are going to have VDG capabilities. So it, it, it's, uh, Nuvi has some VDG capable chargers. There's a couple of other companies that do. There's a couple of uh, ones that are being sold in Europe. Um, so, uh, you kind of have to say, I want a V2G capable charger and then find one and buy it. It's not so much you kind of drive around the corner and you know the one around the corner has got V2G capabilities. Uh, you know, hopefully, you know, 10 years from now, most of them will, or most of them will have an option, you know, 200 bucks extra or whatever. But right now it's a more of a custom uh, capability with only a few uh, brands. And you're gonna have to also have a synchronization between the aggregator and the charger so that you make sure that the chargers 
know how to talk to the aggregator and know how to talk to the vehicle. So that has to be a synchronized uh, purchase at this point. <clears throat> Excellent. Any sense on how programs work where a school district contracts with a school bus company to operate their bus service? Do they share revenues in a vehicle to grid scenario? Is that like a common practice? I'm going to leave that to Tim and, and others who are familiar with the commercial side. Fair enough. Yeah, right, right now, the opportunity at VG revenue is, is just beginning to blossom. So those financial models are beginning to emerge. Um, we work with, you know, typically the school districts that we work with are in Illinois, in ComEd territory, which is part of the PJM marketplace. Uh, the models are beginning to emerge a little more quickly. Uh, we anticipate the third party contractors that we've been talking with and our school districts have been working with, um, developing various scenarios in which those benefits are passed down either in reduced costs to the school district um, or at flat rates and percentage, percentages of revenue sharing. Thank you for answering that, Tim. Yep. So we have some interesting climate up here in the Northeast and one question came across, <laughs> does the outdoor temperature reduce the efficacy of vehicle to grid? We're thinking of obviously our winters and, and ice and snow up here. Any well, thoughts uh, on that? Sure. The, uh, the um, lithium ion batteries are affected by temperature and it's more or less when you start getting towards the freezing point, you have a much reduced amount. Um, this is kind of a complicated uh, answer. I'll try and be really brief. So the car manufacturer, school bus manufacturer may put in a simple heating device to keep the battery from getting too cold. Uh, as long as it's plugged into charge, you can draw a little bit of that power to, to heat up the battery. Um, but the um, V to G just goes with the battery capability. So if it's below freezing, it's been below freezing all night, uh, your charging system, even if you have no V to G, no V to G capability, your charging system, it's going to say, I can't charge very fast now. And when you start driving, you're not going to have a whole lot of power because you let the battery get down well below freezing now. Um, so that's just the same with V2G. I mean, we see, you know, we have to tell the grid operator how much we can do and on a minute by minute basis. So if we let all the cars in a fleet get down to freezing and below, our ability to provide power is going to drop down to, you know, near, you know, 5%, 10% of its rated power. So yeah, cold temperature, if you have no control or management of that, will make it uh, impossible to do high amounts of B to G, yes. Great, so obviously there was, based on the response to the polls, some folks that have already looked into vehicle to grid um, and in doing so, uh, one, uh, one attendee here in the audience mentioned that they found the revenue from our ISO New England demand response wasn't enticing enough to attract third party owners for the batteries. Have you come across partners who would own or operate the bus to reduce the cost of the vehicle to this or the bus to the schools? That may be something for Tim. I don't know, Willa, if that's in your wheelhouse or not. Well, just to clarify one thing. So there's a, a, that's not a model that I mentioned, although it is a possible one. That is that somebody who's getting the revenue, the aggregator or whoever, would actually purchase the whole battery and then own that battery uh, in exchange for the revenue from V to G. So that's the, the question was about that particular business model. And I think that's a pretty tough one because, uh, you know, does it really make sense to have some third party owning the battery in your vehicle, whether it's a school bus or a car? Um, you know, you're driving it, you may not take good care of that battery. Um, so uh, that, that I think it's, I, I think it would be a tough one to convince anybody to, uh, uh, to buy your battery and then just you have it used for, uh, for revenue from uh, grid services. But then in addition, it's demand side management. So remember I talked about participation in the market. There's this wide variety of value. And I think I gave $50 to 1200 or $1,800. So demand side management is not one of those high value services. So if you're just doing straight DSM, Right, that you're not going to earn a great deal from that. Now, it's a nice adder. Maybe that's what you make money on. But if you're saying, 
we're going to just give you this small revenue stream because we haven't actually worked hard enough to get the high value streams from the ISO. And we want you to buy the battery. I, I think you're always going to get a no on, on that proposition. <clears throat> we all, yeah, if I can jump in on that. We'll, yeah, please we'll, do. We've also experienced complications of, of ownership and insurance. And the bus mm. and the battery is a combination versus a separate, separately owned unit. Mm -hmm. um, what we've found manufacturers and and you know those willing to provide third-party financial assistance are a little bit more interested in separating the charger and the infrastructure away from the the bus battery combo. Um, so the school district in that scenario would own the bus and the batteries, and the um, the entity providing the financial assistance. Um, would would own the charger and the infrastructure, and there be some type of a relationship built between the two. Super. Um, as I mentioned, yeah. there are a few more uh, comments in the chat. I think we're going to move on to our next presentation. But will, if you want to peek through that, if there's any additional ones you can answer, please feel free to do that. Um, let's hear a little bit more now about actually developing an electric school bus to grid pilot. Um, with us today is Tim Farker. You've heard him already answering some questions. Thank you so much, Tim. Tim is actually in his ninth year as superintendent for Williamsfield Schools in Williamsfield, Illinois. We're thrilled to have him with us today. Thanks to the virtual world, he can be here. He didn't have to fly in from Illinois. He's all, also the administrative lead for the Bus to Grid initiative, and that's B2G. B2G is a collection of school districts, municipalities, and third-party contractors that are working to electrify school bus fleets at a cost equal to or better than diesels, getting down to that price parity. Now, Mr. Farga is going to provide some insights from their experience at the school developing a B2G pilot, a bus to grid pilot, and highlighting the opportunity to generate revenue, strategies and pitfalls, and the importance of engaging your electric utility in the process. Tim, we'll stop sharing our slides and turn that over to you. Oh, looks like we already have. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Um, so I, I'm just going to talk briefly about getting bus to grid off the off the ground and being able to replicate this in different parts of of the country, different parts of the world. I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, since the Volkswagen uh, settlement fund was established and money was distributed to states across the the U.S., um, and the opportunity to electrify school buses um, has arisen. And I've been studying that, you know, since that time, which is approximately three years, a little longer than three years. Uh, the first quotes that we got for electric school buses were just over $400,000. So obviously, it's something we haven't been able to, uh, that, that wasn't able to materialize at that time. Uh, fast forward, we had an opportunity to secure some grant funding through a, a longtime historical polluting uh, coal-fired power plant. That's, that's about 35 miles southeast of us. Um, as we started doing research into applying for this funding opportunity, uh, it became painfully clear that just electrifying our school buses was, was not going to accomplish our, our goal. Our overall goal was to provide uh, a much healthier uh, transportation experience for our students and staff while also reducing our carbon footprint, reducing our, our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, all we were doing, if we just electrified, um, we would, uh, as the Edwards uh, coal-fired power plant shut down, there was a Powerton coal-fired power plant right across the Illinois River that then picked up the slack to provide more of the electricity for our area. So if we just electrified our fleet, we came to the realization that all we're doing is putting more coal into that power plant. So we're just cleaning our air at the expense of other kids and communities uh, downstream per se or, or upstream. Um, so that's the, where I begin to study and, and learn about vehicle to grid technology and all the work that um, Professor Kempton's been doing. Um, so that was where the, the bus to grid initiative was born. It was born as just a collective of eight school districts and one municipality that, that runs school bus operations for the city of Pekin. Um, it, is ex, it has since expanded across Illinois and, and also includes a school district in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So how do we replicate this um, in other entities? Step one, in, in, in all of these are, are from my um, shoot, it's been maybe two and a half, three years of experience in the with the bus to grid, grid initiative. 
Step one is my, in my view, is to build the coalition of school districts um, and pick the low hanging fruit, the people that are already interested in electrification. Um, as most of you know that are on the call, if you've, if you've been an evangelist for transportation electrification, it takes a little bit for people to wrap their, their minds around it. Um, if you pick the low hanging fruit, you've already, um, you, you don't have to cross that, that bridge. That, that burden of, of information uh, is, is not on you anymore. Uh, the only thing now that you have to communicate and work with districts to, to understand are the benefits of electrification in a V2G format. The key concepts for school, bi-directional energy flow, um, vehicle to building and, and vehicle to grid, you know, those concepts. Uh, it, and it's important to understand that just bi-directional energy flow does not constitute the ability to provide vehicle to grid services. Uh, those, are, those are two different things. And in the, the research that I've done, the technology that Professor Kempton has developed and, and the newbie team um, has, has marketed is by far the, the best on the market. Um, and it, being able to communicate that to school districts as you build your coalition is extremely important. Um, most school districts already realize that their school bus fleet is their second uh, most, their second largest capital expense in their district behind buildings. But what they don't realize, they've never done the math to see how much bang for their buck they're getting out of those expenses. In our school district, and I had not done the math until this, um, until that point about, that was probably about two years ago, our school buses are in motion 7% of the calendar year. So they physically sit still in our bus barn, 93% of the calendar year providing us no value. Uh, and that's our second biggest capital expense. Uh, so from a, you know, just a cost to benefit analysis, how do we, how do we leverage uh, that, that asset um, to provide a little bit more for our kids and community? Uh, after building the coalition and really almost hand in hand engage uh, the utility or utilities uh, that are involved. In Illinois, we have two major utilities. We have ComEd to the north and Ameren, Illinois to the, to the south. Um, we have a lot of electric co-ops uh, in between. So engaging the various utilities or providers is very significant. Uh, the key concepts, uh, as they are adding renewables to their, to their grid, they know that I mean, they fully understand the intermittency of those producers. Um, in Illinois, I know this is true in other areas too, especially more so in California, storage is becoming the bottleneck. Uh, so we have to figure out a way to, um, to provide more, more storage before we can expand our ability to produce. Uh, electric school bus batteries, when connected in a bi-directional way with the ability to provide vehicle to grid services, uh, they provide a utility the opportunity to shorten the amount of time they use their peaker plants. Um, in Illinois right now, those, they're typic typically a natural gas uh, peaker plant. Um, a good example for us in our coalition is the Joliet area has a significant peaker plant just um, upstream from their, from their, their two biggest high school buildings. Um, so probably within three miles of each building, um, they have a natural gas peaker plant. So being able to leverage school bus batteries as an energy storage mechanism so the peaker plants fire less is very beneficial to the community at large. And these school bus batteries can provide these services more than just in the summertime. The one real live instance of, of money making of actual revenue taking place is the Highland Electric model with Beverly, Massachusetts in conjunction with National Grid. Um, they have a summer program where they paid them $200 um, per kilowatt capacity to discharge. Um, and they called on their school bus batteries for uh, a little over 30 times, I think in the summer. Paid the, they have a 60 kilowatt charger. Uh, they generated $12,000 in revenue just for the, the access and the ability to discharge. Um, that's just a summer instance. Um, what we're marketing to ComEd and Ameren, Illinois, um, in our territory, 
is the ability for these bus batteries to be utilized to provide ancillary services to the utilities. For those 93 for ours at our school district, for the 93% of the calendar year that the buses are just sitting in the garage. Conduct a cost benefit analysis. Um, it's, it, and there's a wide variety of audiences that you can, uh, that you can hit and, th and that there are points um, that, that serve. Uh, student and staff health is first and foremost in our mind in everything that we do. So if we can provide an opportunity at, at, at worst, um, at a price that's equal to diesel, um, but it provides a, a, a better, more healthy experience for our staff and students, well, that's a no-brainer. Um, these buses, uh, a key concept uh, to make sure that you include in your cost-benefit analysis is the ability of these buses to move, um, the ability to then provide, to provide um, emergency backup services to other buildings and institutions in your community. Um, so emergency services. Uh, fuel costs are in the news um, nonstop, it seems, but very significantly as of late. Uh, we've done the math on our uh, school bus here, and in a 10-year life cycle, we believe we can save $90,000 in, in fuel costs. Uh, we have a solar array on site, with, and we're locked into a price per kilowatt hour. Um, the best we can do with diesel is we're locked in for a 12-month period in a, in a purchasing agreement. That has gone up on average 4.8% per year in the last three years uh, with a significant, significant jump recently. Maintenance costs, we estimate, will be cut in half. Um, so the math that we conducted with our diesel fleet, it costs us about $40,000 to maintain a diesel school bus for the life of the bus. Um, we believe that's cut in half, uh, so we would experience a $20,000 savings over those 10 years in the switch from diesel to electric. And then VG revenue opportunities are beginning to emerge. Uh, but the thing we constantly communicate to the districts in, in our group in the Bus to Grid initiative is down the road, um, we believe the opportunity to participate in virtual power plants or as a, as a portion of a virtual power plant is has the potential to be even more beneficial than the VOG revenue programs that the utilities may, may create. Um, next step. So you've built your coalition, you've engaged your utilities, developed the fleet electrification plans. Um, make sure that you have all of your, your buses uh, sequenced, labeled, and know the order in which you wanna replace and target the, your oldest you know, uh, most emitting buses first. Um, what we found is once you, when you're communicating with these, with uh, the various stakeholders and various parties, if you can show a concrete plan that you've, that this is, as um, you've engaged in thorough um, analysis of this impact on your building and your community and your operation, uh, it becomes a lot easier to sell. So visuals for us are huge. Um, this is our little bus barn here. We, we run five uh, full, we're, we're a small rural uh, school district. We run five routes daily with type C buses. So this is where we're wanting to get, you know, with our V or G um, bus barn. And we can show this to folks, the plan, the plan is real. And that's just one component within our overall plan for our campus. And we're working with our member districts to develop the same plans for their campuses as well. Uh, engage state and local leaders. Uh, so especially when you have a plan and you have hard numbers and you can hit them with a one pager, uh, the, the cell becomes so much easier. Um, this was a significant reason I feel like in how we were able to get the new energy law passed in Illinois last summer. Um, we had school districts, a coalition of school districts, uh, ready to help solve the, the energy storage bottleneck um, that led to the, um, uh, the ability for lawmakers to pass uh, not just uh, additional opportunities for solar, um, but financial incentives for storage as well. Key concepts for the leaders, the need for storage. Uh, the benefits of mobile storage versus stationary storage. 
uh, the concept of the bus as an energy asset and just the pure nature when you come to the the understanding of of all of those in a, being able to integrate you know the ability for the rate payer and the the local school district taxpayer um, to save just because you're you're a lot more efficient in your in your operations and then look for money um, right now if you I, I think most of the folks on the call know that um, there's $5 billion over five years coming out of the federal EPA for clean school buses. Uh, applications are slated to open at the end of April, and there will be $500 million to $1 billion awarded this fall. Um, so be ready to hit this first, first wave. And that is all I have. I've got additional slides that could answer some questions that, that may arise. Great, feel free to leave those up then. Tim, thank you so much. Um, we'll dig into some questions that I'm, as, as we mentioned earlier, feel free to throw your questions into the chat. We're hoping to have some robust conversation here. Um, just kind of looking through and picking these out, Tim, no real order here, but um, thoughts on the electric distribution system, whether it's robust enough to manage vehicle to grid. Somebody said, could it top out, you know, from this kind of demand? Actually, no, I think decentralizing it helps the whole system at large. Um, if you can decentralize and spread out these distributed energy resources, then you, you replace fewer components grid wide, you know. Um, if one, when the, the energy is centralized, you have to have larger components at one, one end of the distribution network in order to, um, in order to be able to, to produce, store, and distribute. That's, and that's a, you know, we're small town folks. We live in a, this is a village of 650 people. We're typically, we're at the end of a run in Ameren, Illinois. So when the power goes out, guess who's the last to be restored? <laughs> I mean, it only makes sense. You, you get most of your customers first. So to be able to distribute this energy in a more balanced way on the grid, you know, I think is it's a plus rather than a minus. You know, and speaking of the nuts and bolts of, of emergency backup, you know, if there was a need for emergency service from the grid, is there a special plug that's required at the emergency site to power? There would be, yeah, and that's a, you know, that's really quick work from a skilled electrician is all it is. You're, you're seeing a lot more of that, you, um, and Professor Kempton could probably speak to that, um, but you, you know, as I follow my feed daily, uh, you're, you're seeing a lot of opportunities for uh, vehicle to vehicle to charge, charging, um, vehicle to building, so on and so forth. Um, in terms of the garage where the um, vehicles are housed, is there? Do you have any thoughts about siting vehicle to grid in in a, within a garages? Whether or not the national fire code concerning lithium batteries batteries would come into play is that even an issue? No, that's not it. As long as the the buses themselves are are deemed safe, you know, I they're. That, that comes up as arguments within our community. And it's kind of easy to remind them that we have a lot of <laughs> unleaded gasoline and diesel fuel sitting in that bus barn right now. Um, so the, the potential for, um, you know, for, for damage to that bus barn or fire is probably greater right now than it is if we filled it with batteries. Do the buses end up having to be stored indoors? Uh, sounds like a lot of buses are not stored in garages. So curious to know if there's any requirements there when using this type of technology. No requirements. Um, they, they are more efficient when they're at a, a stable temperature. Uh, the, the charger um, you know, will, will work the same way. Um, everything's a little bit more efficient when it, when it runs at 70 degrees. Um, which I think that's true of me too. <laughs> I hear you. We're still dealing with winter up here. <laughs> um, there was an interesting comment in the chat earlier, and, I, and I'll get to it now. I think um, the audience member said they had heard that some of the high value markets are very thin, they're saying. For instance, the installation of a single high profile battery storage system in South Australia caused the prices for ancillary services to collapse. 
Any thoughts about the implications of vehicle to grids value proposition? So I, I'll, I'll maybe step in on this one yeah, and maybe please come do something it. else I'd add. But Perfect. I did write in response to that in the chat. Um, th it's correct at some level. So any kind of electricity market that's competitive, when you bring in new providers of electricity or providers of grid services, you know, you do push the price down because it's a competitive market. But um, <clears throat> so, you know, just kind of estimating the most valuable market, you know, you take that highest dollar number uh, in my slides, um, you know, it might be five to 10% of the cars and buses and trucks, if they provided V to G, you know, five to 10% would mostly satisfy that market. So, you know, that's like, hey, that's only five or 10%, but it's going to take quite a while before we have, you know, 10% of the vehicles, not only electric, but also V to G capable. But in the meantime, <clears throat> we're electric, there's, there's more than one market. You know, we had a list, list of different kinds of markets and a range of value. So as you satisfy the most valuable market, regulation is what was being referred to in the question. Um, then you go to the next most valuable and the third one down, you know. So there's a lot of different things that need to be provided. One is that second by second balancing that I referred to. Uh, another is when a power plant fails, you know, what happens? So they quickly need someone else to come in and provide supply. Um, uh, a third is this sort of peak power, you know, when there's a peak, summer peak in the, in the South and most of the country, we're getting up to you know, Maine and, and New Hampshire, you're, you're maybe winter peaking. So those few hours where it's a peak, then there would be, the, those are all different markets. So we're not gonna saturate all of those markets for quite a while. I don't know exactly how long. And, we're putting more and more renewables on the electric system. So the more renewables we have in, the more need is for this kind of balancing service that can be provided by storage of any kind. And it's most economical if provided by vehicles, because again, the battery's already been purchased for transportation. We're gonna use it that 93% of the time, like Tim's number there, um, that the, the, the vehicle's not in use for transportation. So yes, there's an effect, Yes, that high, those highest numbers that I've got, those are going to be lower over time. Uh, but they, I don't believe it's correct that the market for storage or the need for storage is thin. I think it'll be hard for us in the V2G uh, uh, world to keep up with the need for storage. <clears throat> when I talk to electric people or renewables people, it's like, hey, we need storage. Where's the storage going to come from? Storage is expensive. You know? So the last thing I'm worried about is that the markets are too thin. <clears throat> Excellent. Tim, back over to you. Have you ever considered putting solar panels on your buses? Not on the buses, but we have them on site. You know, and really from a value prop for us, we've got a bus barn, right? So those buses are only going to be outside for 7% of the calendar year. Um, it'd be more um, efficient for us to put that solar panel on top of the barn where the buses are stored. But yeah, we do. Our, that's we're. We have a solar array on site. We'll have rooftop solar added to the building this summer. Uh, we'll have some stationary battery storage, and then we'll have all the infrastructure in place. We'll just add chargers and buses as finances allow. Excellent. Well, there are some more questions in the chat if you guys want to check those out and see about responding. At this point in the program, I'm, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague, Peggy O'Neill Vivanco with Vermont Clean Cities. Peggy, over to you. Hi there, welcome. I'm Peggy, and thanks again for joining us. Uh, so at this point, I was actually going to introduce Gary Marquess. He's the Director of Operations and Finance at the South Burlington School District. Um, and, however, uh, Gary had um, an emergency, and he can't be here today. And um, he did, he was actually just going to talk. He didn't have a slide deck prepared. So you're stuck with me just for just for a couple of points because I'm just going to hit the wave tops. Um, so um, you can just go to the next slide. So um, South Burlington School District um, is the fourth largest school district in Vermont, and they applied in 2020 for a Vermont VW um, funding for four electric school buses, a V to G. They're working with Highland Electric. Um, for their kind of turnkey solution 
and with Green Mountain Power, which is the largest utility here in Vermont. And GMP has a lot of infrastructure incentives as well as vehicle incentives. So they were coupling the VW funding with the Highland Electric sort of turnkey. Highland Electric is gonna own the buses for I think two years. Um, and they had a, an agreement um, with GMP or they will have an agreement with GMP as far as the kind of any revenue from the electric um, discharge and, and, and revenue piece. Um, the point of Gary was really to talk about the kind of what, why their school district um, decided to go with these electric buses. Um, so I will speak from like the kind of grant side because I worked with the school district a little bit on the, on the grant. Um, so, you know, um, Professor Kempton and Tim were talking really at a, at a super high detailed level. This is kind of school district, really basic, looking at getting, getting the utility involved um, very early on in the conversation, um, identifying the, the routes that would work for uh, electric buses. Um, we are in the Northeast, uh, it's cold, it's hilly. Um, South Burlington is um, urban-ish, um, but they do have routes um, that go out a little bit, you know, kind of a little bit further, but not super rural. So there were some really, um, key components um, in their, their routes that allowed them to consider um, electric. Um, and they were hoping that, you know, certainly in summer, the goal would then be to be able to um, provide power to the grid during any outage events, whether it's like a brownout, we're getting hotter summers here, like really hot. Um, and we also still have some power outages um, in the winter and in the shoulder seasons during when there are kind of wind storms that um, down wires. Um, the buses were originally supposed to arrive ages ago, um, COVID, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they are now slated to arrive in spring of um, 2022. Last I heard was April of next month. But I know Lou Brzee is on this call. Lou, if you have any other details, you can either jump on or just put it in the chat. But I believe, um, I believe next month the buses will be here. So there really isn't um, you know, anything to talk about as far as this pilot. Um, we just wanted a school district who is entering this um, um, agreement to be able to kind of speak to, um, to those issues. So that's really all I have if you have any questions. I may not be able to answer them, but I could try. Can I jump in real quick? Sure. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that um, as far as full-size school buses go, the four major manufacturers now um, are Thomas, Bluebird, Lion, and IC Bus. Um, and all four of them have committed to bi-directional capacity within their um, electric school buses. Um, I also think it's, it's fair to mention that Nuvi uh, works closely with Bluebird and Lion Electric. Um, we have our, we as in the Bus to Grid initiative has, we have two electric uh, Bluebird school buses uh, in central Illinois at Pekin and at Hollis Consolidated. And they both are connected to Nuvi um, chargers, uh, and the technology works works well um, with both. So, just kind of a proof of concept. Now we don't get any VG revenue because we're in Amherst, Illinois territory, and there's currently not a program um, to compensate. Thanks, thanks, Tim. Yes, um, and then next week, I guess, uh, Jonathan, can you slip to the next uh, slide? Next week, we're, we're going to have um, another webinar on funding, financing, and incentives. And at that point, um, we're going to have Green Mountain Power talk about their incentives, probably using South Burlington you know, as a, as, a case, as a case example, but we have a couple other pilots going on in the state of Vermont um, that they can speak to. 
So join us next week, funding, financing, and incentives for electric school buses. Next slide. And so a number of you have talked about, have mentioned the EPA Clean School Bus Rebate Program. This is super exciting. Um, this is the bipartisan infrastructure law that was recently passed um, and $5 billion over five years for clean school buses. Um, this first cycle is going to be a rebate. They're, um, they're slated to open up um, the, the program in uh, the end of next month, April, 2022. Half of the, all the funds are gonna go towards zero emission buses. Um, and then the other half will go towards low and defined as clean school buses. So CNG, propane, um, biodiesel. Um, eligible recipients, um, you know, school buses, districts, contractors, and nonprofit school associations. Um, they are going to have um, program priorities. They're looking for high need local um, education, agency, education agencies, tribal schools, rural and low income areas. And they're looking at a lower cost share, um, which is usually something that can, can be a little overwhelming for, um, for school districts to, to manage. Um, next slide, please. And with, within this um, rebate program, there's, there, there are some links here. And again, we will send out this slide deck along with the recording after the, the webinar today. There's a technical assistance page on the EPA site. Um, and they're gonna be working with the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation for additional technical um, support. So you'll, you can get information on charging and fueling infrastructure. So if you're going for electric V to G or for any of the alternative fuel options um, like propane, um, bio, CNG, you will have um, those resources available. The rebate program as it's set up or looks like to be set up um, is going to be a lottery selection. And um, they are looking for a relatively quick timeline to receive funding. Um, and it will be an online application. And I encourage anyone, energy committees um, who are working with your schools or school districts to create this 2020, um, 2022 clean school bus inventory sheet um, as a way to identify your vehicles that um, are, have the potential to be replaced. Uh, please note there are, um, uh, there's an email address for the clean school bus at epa.gov. Uh, to submit comments on the process, the procedures. Um, certainly a bunch of clean cities folks have also advocated for, um, you know, for, for, for equal distribution. So I think no, um, no state will get more than 10% of, um, of the funding for the funding round. They're really looking to try to distribute the funds across the states. Um, so even, you know, our three little rural states up here um, we have a good shot at getting some funding for our school districts. And sign up for um, their email listserv so that you can get regular update, uh, updates. Um, that link here is below. And again, this will be available later uh, after the webinar. Peggy, can I jump in really quick and just ask sure. a question? Because one thing that I've noticed with this program and had some conversations about, I, there's still guidance coming, right? We know that there that there's not all the details of the program haven't been released yet. But one of the interesting things that I didn't see in the eligible applicants space was um, student transportation providers. Um, here in the Northeast, I think a lot of schools don't, don't uh, own and operate their own buses. They may contract those services out to, for example, a first student or a student transportation of America. And the current definition of the eligible contractors appears to be folks that can sell buses, folks that it doesn't say specifically that provide, you know, these types of services to the school. So I think this is one area that's going to need some more clarification um, yes, going I'm down the looking, road. Yeah, I'm just looking through my notes right now. Eligible contractors yeah. and nonprofit school transportation associations that apply for funds, blah, blah, blah. It's my understanding yeah. they'll qualify. That they will qualify, Tim? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, those like the like the first student, the Betcha bus. Okay. Um, yes, uh, but I do encourage you because because I did um, email the um, Clean Bus uh, program and let them know that this is uh, you know really important uh, important avenue um, for for them to consider and recognize that an eligible contractor must also be considered. Perfect. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. All right, and then next up, um, any questions? Oh, should we start a nonprofit bus transportation supplier in the Northeast? Yes, Dick, you want to do that? <laughs> um, I didn't see any. Yes, yes, David, I was looking at my notes from that webinar yesterday, and they may have the recording on site uh, on that website uh, from yesterday's webinar. Um, I think I believe the recording should be posted in a couple of weeks. Oh, a couple of um, weeks. Yeah, I think they're, they're a not little as bit quick delayed. as we are. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to wait a couple of weeks. Um, let's see. Any? I think that's it. All right. And now I'm going to introduce um, Sarah Mills Knapp from Maine Clean Communities, who's gonna talk a little bit about the FPA grants um, and wrap us up. Thanks, Sarah. Peggy. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah Millsnap from Maine Clean Communities. Um, so we did just wanna mention, even though this is for transit agencies that is open right now, I realize the information on the slide is wrong. We forgot to put in the new, I'll put it in the chat here. Um, the due date for the, the low no emission program that's open right now for transit agencies is actually May 31st at the Lincoln. Um, so this can be grants to transit agencies for buses or bus facilities um, and is a great opportunity, at least for transit related electrification. And we can go to the next slide. We'll, we'll have more on, on school buses next week, like we talked about, we can dive into funding and structure a little bit more. So I just wanted to wrap up by reminding everybody about the resources that your Clean Cities coalitions can provide to you. And please reach out to Peggy, Jessica, or I, depending on what state you're in, so that we can help support um, the work that you're doing. So the um, there are great references and resources from, from DOE's Clean Cities, um, site that they support the AFDC uh, website. I was just looking at it myself, actually, because I was thinking about getting a new car. And they have lots of information there about light duty, medium duty, heavy duty. Um, there's laws and incentives, case studies. They've got information about new vehicles and um, great calculation of cost of ownership for fleets. So please visit there anytime you have questions or want to know what want to know what new cars are coming out or what um, technology exists. Go ahead to the next slide. Our Clean Cities Coalitions, like we said, we, we do a lot of events and obviously um, provide as much information and education as possible. We also provide direct technical assistance. So if you are in one of our states and have questions about any of these programs we've talked about, please reach out. We can um, we have two levels of pretty specialized technical support. We have a technical response service where we can get information about case studies throughout the country. So if you want to know if a particular technology has been used or have um, you know, examples from other states, we can get great responses there. We also have um, much more specialized tiger teams are called that can provide expert technical problem solving support and we can connect you with those resources, um, especially when you're talking about something like vehicle to grid or other types of, um, you know, newer technologies and technical challenges, we can help support that. Go ahead to the next slide. So we have our last poll here just to get a little, um, little more information regarding fleet electrification. What are some of the biggest roadblocks that everybody on the call has, has seen? Um, we'd love to, to hear more just so we can kind of plan some additional webinars and help address any challenges you all have had. So I think the poll should come up. Not, there it is, there we go. Okay, it looks like needing support with grant applications taking an early lead here. And that is also something that your Clean Cities Coalitions can help you with. Um, we actually just, we submitted a, a grant application for an island um, here in Maine that's looking for um, an electric school bus. So we, we always would like to help support as much as possible. We are, um, you know, have, have funding and expertise to help support that. 
Right. Inadequate charging infrastructure, lack of technical assistance. Yep. A lot of these federal and state funding opportunities can be really challenging um, to apply to, and they seem really daunting, I think, as, as packages. This is really helpful. Great. Well, thank you all. Let's see. We'll share the results out so everybody can see. Looks like it's a little bit of everything in the end. Uh, lack of technical assistance and needing support. Yeah. Great. Hopefully we can we can help address some of those um, questions around funding and potential structure of funding for school buses next week. We'd love to see you all there and we thank you for participating. We really appreciate it and the questions and discussion were, were really great. So thank you all and have a great night. Thanks everyone. We're giving you a little bit of time back at the yeah, end of the day here. <laughs> if, and if we have any additional questions, feel free to, um, to email us directly. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Professor Captain and Tim. Thanks. Thanks.